I'm here uh, today to talk about the research we've been doing using Blue Waters. Um, so my lab has uh, had access to Blue Waters through uh, GLCPC, Great Lake Consortium for Petascale Computation. And we've been using Blue Waters for uh, studying uh, protein dynamics. Uh, we've been using molecular dynamics to do that. And I'm going to talk about some of the methods that uh, we have been developing and some of the applications that we've had uh, to address the time scale issue in sampling uh, protein dynamics uh, and uh, to show that how we can actually use microsecond level dynamics, which is feasible uh, to study the millisecond level uh, dynamics uh, using enhanced sampling techniques. So we are interested in uh, studying the larger scale conformational changes of proteins because they are important to understand how proteins work. And uh, if you are interested in, for instance, uh, designing drugs for proteins, uh, you cannot ignore the conformational changes that protein, proteins have. Uh, otherwise, you're going to end up with um, uh, wrong answers. So uh, studying larger scale conformational changes of protein is very important for the structural biology of proteins. And uh, with molecular dynamics, we can actually have access to the uh, conformational changes of protein and to see conformational changes of proteins, although there is a time scale issue. Uh, so uh, after a very short introduction on, on the problem, uh, I will discuss first a case study that shows that what is usually uh, called uh, unbiased molecular dynamics is not really that reliable. Uh, and then uh, I will show you how we can use biased molecular dynamics to study uh, difficult problems uh, in a structural biology of proteins. And uh, that comes down to developing some uh, enhanced sampling techniques, especially using the so-called loosely coupled multiple copy algorithms. And uh, I will show you some applications of that. So the particular problems that uh, we have been working on, um, they fall within the uh, membrane transport proteins. And uh, these are proteins that usually have larger scale conformational changes as part of their function. For instance, membrane transporters, uh, these are one of the subclasses of membrane transport proteins. They undergo larger scale conformational changes typically uh, to um, go from an inward facing conformation to an outward facing conformation. An inward facing conf conformation like this, which is uh, open to the intracellular side of the membrane or the cytoplasmic side of the membrane, an outward facing state like this, which is open to the extracellular side or the per periplasmic side of the membrane of the cell. Um, so these conformational changes are very, very important for the function of membrane transporters because they are known to follow a mechanism called the alternating axis mechanism. They do not want the binding site of the protein, which is usually somewhere here, uh, to be accessible to both sites of the membrane at the same time. Uh, this is how they become active membrane transporters rather than being passive. For channels that are passive membrane transport proteins, also larger scale conformational changes occur, not necessarily in all of them, but in many channels that are passive uh, membrane transport proteins, we also have larger scale conformational changes. Uh, I have some examples of, of these proteins that uh, we have been studying using blue waters. Uh, this is one of the earliest uh, examples that we studied using the uh, blue waters resources, uh, which is a membrane transporter, and this is one of the most recent ones that we are studying, which is a channel called mechanosensitive channel of large conductance. In both of these membrane transport proteins, we have larger scale conformational changes, and they play a very, very important role in the function of these proteins. Now, 
uh, how these uh, large scale conformational changes are triggered. They are usually triggered when something uh, like a change in the uh, chemistry or a change in the environment or change in uh, a mechanical change, something of that sort happens. Uh, for instance, when a drug binds to a protein uh, or when uh, 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 another type of ligand binds to a protein or when uh, uh, the pH changes and a particular amino acid in the protein protonates or for instance, uh, when something in the environment of the protein changes. For instance, we actually recently showed that uh, for this particular membrane uh, transporter, it's, it's a bacterial uh, multidrug transporter, uh, if you change its environment, if you take this uh, from its native membrane environment and put it in a different membrane environment, which is a still a, a uh, phospholipidic membrane environment, very similar to its native one, but just a slightly differently uh, with a different head group. So if you take it from a phosphoethanolamine um, um, membrane uh, environment and put it in a phosphocholine membrane environment, its behavior changes completely. Um, so this is an example of a uh, change in the environment that could result in larger scale conformational changes occurring or not occurring. The uh, larger scale conformational changes in uh, oligopeptide uh, transporters or proton coupled oligopeptide transporters to be more spe specific uh, is uh, something that we've been studying over the last uh, couple of years. And uh, the uh, proposed mechanism for these transporters basically involves uh, the protonation of a specific amino acids in the protein as well as binding and unbinding and the transport of uh, their substrates that could be uh, pretty much any oligopeptide like uh, a di dialanine peptide or something like that. So um, the presence or absence of a proton or uh, a, a substrate uh, in the binding site of the protein could change its behavior. So it's very tempting to study this kind of proteins and the relevance of the different, uh, different environments or different uh, conditions or, for instance, uh, the, the protonation or deprotonation of an amino acid or binding of, uh, or unbinding of an amino acid by taking, for instance, the crystal structure of the protein model it, put it in a membrane environment, and then try to change this um, condition, whether it's being the protonation state of uh, an amino acid or the presence of a substrate, change that condition and see how protein behaves. So this is actually a pr probably the most common, the most popular form of using molecular dynamics for the study of protein uh, dynamics and mechanisms, which is being used routinely. And you can find that in the literature uh, abundantly. So, but is it actually uh, something reasonable to do? If you want to use the so-called unbiased molecular dynamic simulations or equilibrium molecular dynamic simulations. So we actually use blue waters to show that this is probably not a very good idea. Uh, we studied this uh, protein, we wanted to study the uh, conformational changes of this protein, but before doing that, we just wanted to see if we use the common approach, which is just model the protein and change, say, the protonation states or put a, a substrate in the binding site, do that and see what happens. So if you do that, you actually do see interesting things happening. Uh, we uh, tried eight different conditions, that means different protonation states or substrates, uh, and for every simulation, which was 400 nanosecond, we repeated it twice to see whether the results are reproducible or not. And this is something which is actually missing in a lot of uh, reports if you look at the literature, the reproducibility. So if you do that, you may actually get something interesting. For instance, uh, here we are looking at something that we thought is important, which is the, uh, the interdomain angle between these two major domains of the protein, I call it the CN bundle interdomain angle, or say the distance between two loops. If you do these uh, simulations in two different conditions, and I don't want to get into the details what these different conditions are, but say different protonation states, we actually see different behavior. So we can um, 
get excited and go and publish our findings. And this is what actually uh, is not very uncommon. But if you repeat these simulations, you may not get the same thing. And this is actually usually the case. There is a lot of stochasticity involved in molecular dynamic simulations. And um, especially if you are interested in processes that typically take milliseconds to occur, uh, and if you run microsecond level simulations or sub-microsecond level simulations, although you may get some interesting results, but uh, it is very difficult to read too much into them. Um, so I just want to show you that this is a common practice. So I, uh, I put the a reference for this exact same protein and, and the exact same conditions that we used uh, and with uh, 200 nanosecond simulations showing that, uh, yes, the protein behaves differently. So we have discovered something important about it. So this is something that is being done, although it's not really accurate. So how can we go beyond this kind of applications? To go beyond this kind of applications, we have to go beyond microsecond level or sub-microsecond level simulations. And for uh, proteins that have time scales that, are, uh, that, that undergo processes like large scale conformational changes that the conformational changes are very slow, it is very difficult to do that with unbiased molecular dynamics. And we have to use biased molecular dynamics. So the methodology involves different types of biasing. And I don't want to get into the details of it. But uh, very briefly, it involves um, um, path optimization, pathfinding algorithms, like string method, for instance, is a very common one. Uh, do you see a kind of a cartoon representation of a string method that tries to find a minimum free energy pathway, and then uh, doing free energy calculations along that. There are a lot of improvements that we've been working on over the last couple of years. For instance, uh, since we use uh, typically collective variables uh, to do our search uh, rather than atomic coordinates, uh, we recently uh, discovered that uh, using uh, the regular Euclidean Cartesian coordinate system for collective variables to measure the distances for the collective variables, the way that we, we measure distances for atomic coordinates, uh, to do um, derivatives and integration the way that we do for uh, regular atomic coordinates is not right for collective variables because these are not following a, re a, a Euclidean geometry. Uh, they are following uh, more generalized geometry, uh, for instance, a Riemannian geometry. And we need to do our calculations right if we want to uh, find invariant uh, answers. If you are looking for a f minimum free energy path in a collective variable st uh, space, uh, if you don't use the right geometry to find your minimum free energy path, your minimum free energy path is not going to be invariant under coordinate transformations, which means your pathway is not going to be so much meaningful. Because a minimum free energy path, if it wants to be meaningful, it needs to be invariant too. You don't want to find a different pathway if you just use a different collective variable. Or if you uh, do a uh, transformation of the same collective variable. So using the Riemannian geometry helps with getting more robust answers. Um, so, uh, and also many other ideas that I, wanna, I don't want to get into the details here. But really, the key uh, point here that I want to make is the uh, multi copy uh, molecular dynamics, which is uh, possible with NAMD now, uh, which basically allows you to use TCL scripting to uh, allow for communication between multiple uh, instances of NAMD. Uh, in, in our case, we typically use hundreds of uh, copies of the same system that are biased differently and communicate with each other by uh, sending and receiving uh, very little information about their collective variables and things like that. Uh, so you can develop a lot of different algorithms uh, that uh, you can uh, categorize them generally as loosely coupled multiple copy molecular dynamics uh, algorithms. Uh, that is very simple because you can use TCL scripting for that without really losing any uh, 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 losing any um, scalability. Uh, 
And uh, with that, uh, we have uh, now uh, several different versions of the string method with swarms of trajectories and uh, umbrella sampling. Uh, with these methods, we recently uh, characterized the minimum free energy path of uh, the particular uh, proton couple oligopeptide transporter that I showed you before. Uh, we found the minimum free energy path and we calculated the uh, free energy along that pathway. And now we are using the same approach to study the mechanosensitive channel of large conductance uh, MSCL. And uh, these are uh, my group members that um, the PhD and master's students in my lab who are uh, using uh, blue waters to study the dynamics of uh, proteins. And thank you very much.